Get your Unsi and Lahore rocks today from IamMelaninMagic.com. I am Melanin Magic and so are you. Experience the I Am Melanin Magic difference by going to our website www.IamMelaninMagic.com and purchasing your products today. I am Melanin Magic and Welcome so to are Nisha's you. Locks, Beauty Tips, and Potpourri, the channel where we get it all in. You can also learn more about the I Am Melanin Magic brand. Thank you for stopping by. Hello, hello, beautiful butterflies and perfect people. Beautiful butterflies in transformation, just like me. Welcome to the channel. Welcome to Tunisia's Locks, Beauty Tips, and Potpourri. I hope that you are feeling peaceful. I hope that you're feeling productive, prosperous. I hope that you are living life passionately and pursuing your purpose on point and living in the lap of plenty, which is a state of mind. Welcome to our channel. It is Wednesday. As you know, we are discussing this book. We are going to veer from the previous format. It occurred to me this morning that this book, as you heard me say in the beginning, is copyright. And so as such, for me to read verbatim from this book, it could create potential problems for my channel. It has nothing to do with the individual. Well, in a way it does, because if she were to make an issue about it, and this book is out of print, as you know, which means if I had done as much as I had done for the African-American, the Black diaspora, whatever you want to say, movement, there will be no way I would let my book go out of print. So there has to be a reason that this book is out of print. And in some sense, it feels like it's been pulled from certain shelves. Likely that would have to have been by request. So, so as to respect what is legal, whether I'm reading this or the Cabalion. However, I doubt that Trimagistus will come back after all this time to pursue me reading that book. I'm joking. Albie, that's enough. She has become a little bit cray gray. Shout out to Miss T. So we're going into um, this hair thing by the lovely uh, Joanne Cornwell. And we're in chapter three. And what I'm going to do is paraphrase the essence of the chapter so that we can discuss it. And uh, the points that she makes, don't forget to give this a thumbs up, like, share, and subscribe, and don't forget to comment. I'm going to definitely need your comments on this. She gives a lot of meat in this book. Uh, within just a few pages, she addresses and goes into depth like she has previously in other chapters and pages into quite a bit of content. She gives you quite a bit to chew on. This sort short section really speaks about the role that uh, a subservient projection of image has had for African-American women in the workplace, especially during a time where they are working in the private sector for individuals and whether or not they can carry that image appropriately according to acceptable standards can be the difference between being on the street and not having a job or being able to take care of your family. So the reality is that certain sacrifices had to be made and women, regardless of what their particular sass and pizzazz might be under normal situations, you know, when they're able to look in their ethnicity, is having to be curtailed or totally revamped or turned upside down. These are my words to meet certain uh, culturally acceptable standards of assimilation, culturally acceptable standards that are not our standards at that time, but were the standards of the minority, but called majority a group of people. And so this is very, very important because those attitudes and those cultural mores continue to persist. And when you look at when this book was written, which was 1997, even though we've made a lot of progress, there are many women today who still don't feel free or many women today who are not free. I mean, let's face it, didn't, what was it the Dove Act just within the last couple of years during COVID that has brought more attention to young people's right to wear their hair as they want? I believe it was more recently in the military where women were given just a tad bit more leeway with regard to what they could do with their hair that is acceptable. Please write in the comments and give the specifics of what I'm uh, uh, referring to if you know the specifics. But 
here where she talked about the stability of your job, whether you were a maid or you were doing something else domestic, which oftentimes were the jobs that many of us could have. And we respected our mothers and grandmothers who had to do that because that was what the options were. But those jobs depended upon your ability to toe the line with regard to how you look, because if you looked too ethnic, if you looked too black, if you looked too colorful, then you could be shown your way out of your job. So this is this is very serious and your job security um, made the difference. And, and she refers to the idea that oftentimes the way you looked meant more than the skills you had for the job. And so many women would have to get themselves looking in a way that, that was acceptable, whether they had to wear a hairnet or they had to wear clothes that were less than feminine and very blocky and just kind of very prudish um, just to be able to get by. And oftentimes they themselves probably felt a little bit embarrassed about how they had to look because it was oftentimes, I feel as she implies, the antithesis of how they would normally dress, say maybe within their own neighborhoods or within their own homes or maybe even... Uh, going to church and we're talking about the hair and anything else that looked too culturally out of step with what was acceptable from a Eurocentric standpoint, but also in terms of what they were, they felt were, was acceptable for us. So you had to straighten your hair, you had to wear a hairnet, or you had to pull your hair back. It needed to be plain. And I'm going to reference this. And if you guys, uh, know what I'm talking about. I want you to write it in the comments. I remember seeing that movie. I can't think of what it was, but it, it went into how the Creole people got their name, I believe. Vanessa Williams starred in that movie, and they went so far as to talk about how Black women were so colorful and so creative that this their beauty was oftentimes a threat to others outside of the the race. And so as such legislation, many women push their husbands to to pass legislation that diminished uh, our lateral freedom with regard to how we could style our hair and how we could, could look because we had all kinds of beautiful hairstyles, you know, like our crowns were our glory. And, you know, we, we, we traditionally are a very expressive, colorful people with a multitude of expression channels. And when those laws were passed, women were told to cover their hair. We had to cover our hair in those days. And so even in doing that, the hats that we began to wear still took the centerpiece and still were sources of admiration and beauty by many, including men who were outside of the African-American race. And so that too became a problem. So you can see that these things are serious, but that is just one frame of reference and if you can specify exactly what i'm talking about or you recall that please put it in the notes but um the established order as she says it had to be held and she talked about feeling and embodying and internalizing this sense of embarrassment that she knew that these women perhaps maybe uh were embarrassed themselves to be seen and that they had to camouflage the most beautiful aspects of their individuality for their jobs. She wondered, you know, as a young person, what that was like or what they were like at home. So I think I thought that that was amazing um, because this, although it was not legislated, it was legislated. It was on the books and it was the difference between surviving, being able to take care of your children, contribute to your household, take care of yourself and being on the street or having to beg. So you didn't have a choice. And so um, the way you looked was literally, there was a checklist and any violations could seriously become a major problem and did become a major problem. So um, a quote here says, uh, we know that the strategies many of them used to get over were not always healthy, but it made them able to live lives free of bitter want. So then she talked about um, 
you know, the, the way you looked became associated with ethnic stability. And you all are very familiar with this because, you know, that's why many people who could pass passed. Because if you had to deny your heritage in order to get by and you could look more Caucasian, and that meant that you could get a job, it meant that you were treated differently, it meant that you had unspoken and spoken freedoms that other people didn't get who were of a different complexion than you, then you did what you had to do. And you saw a lot of people passing and totally walking away from their, their ethnic heritage. So fast forward here. Um, she gives kudos to the women who began to speak out and even go so far as to go to court to fight for their freedom and their right to look how they want it to look. Um, the right to define beauty in the terms that were acceptable to them, not the terms that were projected onto them by the outside group. Um, she respected that. So when we read this, we are hearing from someone who has embodied and internalized not only the shame and the guilt, but also a desire to rebel against what was projected onto us as black women as our freedoms were usurped not only in a legislative, governmental, socioeconomic way, but also all the way down to how you looked. How you looked. I get to tell you how you're going to look today. And if you look too black, then you may be dismissed or you may not be able to come back in here anymore. So for those of us who even in my age group, let's say you're in your 50s, you can identify with some of this. If you're older, you may definitely be able to identify with pressures that you felt over time with regard to your ability to express originality and embrace your naturalness or embrace your blackness at certain levels because of one or two things, or maybe even more. Number one, uh, was it going to be suitable in your workplace? If you had a public employer or a private employer, would you be reprimanded? Would you be called into office? Would you be looked down upon because you looked too ethnic? And then not only that, our own people, people who had embraced total assimilation and annihilation of their ethnic creative expression, looking upon you and saying, oh, did you see Miss Ali today? She actually had an afro. Can you believe she came to work with them naps? Can you imagine people who were so brainwashed and indoctrinated or in a manner of speaking whitewashed in their mind that they would judge another who is embracing their own naturalness and unique identity and feeling a sense of pride that they themselves would feel ashamed if maybe a sister left out a coil or her edges were not pulled back or straightened enough or maybe she should dare to, as I said, have some puffballs or wear an afro or not get it quite straight enough. Like you're going to catch heat by not only the outsiders, but you're going to catch heat from your own. That's a hell of a, of a paradox. When you think about the psychological kidnapping and the psychological abuse and the level of brainwashing, re, uh, programming and indoctrination and it goes beyond the hair because it does a job on a, on a mind. It's a whole nother level of seasoning that took place long after we washed up on the shores of North America after the Middle Passage. This is a serious piece here. So she gets into a lot of heavy stuff here um, and she said that Despite some of the individual triumphs and victories in the courtroom, perhaps, um, that sense of self-consciousness still remained amongst a large percentage of African-American women that um, there is this unspoken reality or this unspoken rule that says you need to look like what you're expected to look like. And I remember thinking, Shortly after I got my locks, if I had still been in the public school system, would I have been as comfortable or what would I have had some level of self-consciousness? 
I mean, it's something that happens to you when you are victims of systemic racism and discrimination and prejudice, because we're talking about different things here that you yourself don't even recognize. Many of us who might have been walking around with a certain level of self-hatredness or self-consciousness or shame that you wouldn't have even realized because it didn't play out in a blatant way, but it was subversive. It was subversive. It was infiltrating you at a level that perhaps you didn't recognize the damage that it was doing. But now that you have embraced your own natural beauty and you've let the other stuff go and you don't give a damn what someone else thinks and you recognize that the beauty, if you all haven't watched my last Sister Locks Journey video, I probably should have given it a different name, but it's a video I put out about, who about a couple of months ago. And I dig into the superiority and the beauty of the diverse forms of creative expression that those of us that are very melanated uh, are able to feature as a hallmark of our reality and existence and beauty. And it's really amazing when you recognize that the kink in our hair does not limit us. It actually puts us so far above in terms of what we can express in terms of beauty and understanding that every look that's in creation, whether it's a Taiwanese look or Native American look or a Caucasian look, you can find an African, an African American, but an African that has that woman within her. Whether you go by mitochondria or whether you go by the beauty of how she looks, you can find a black Marilyn Monroe. You can find Whatever other ethnic group you want to find, she exists within that black woman. And my husband always says that that's the, one of the main reasons that black men don't need to go anywhere because they can find any kind of black woman they want. We come in all shades. And many of you may even think that some of the darkest people, that, that Africa only produces the dark and that the only reason why you're fair is because <laughs> you you were mixed with uh, another race, but that's so far from the truth. You can find blue-eyed people, which is a recessive gene on the continent. You can find people that are fairer than me on the continent. So everything goes back first to the deepest colors of melanin can produce any range of color, which means you can produce any range of anything, whether it's uh, skin texture, skin color, hair texture, the level of kink, whatever it is. So it's actually something that allows you to produce an infinity of hues, colors, textures, and beauty. It's something that we are now beginning more to embrace at a level that was impossible before or highly irregular in terms of an anomaly. So she talks a lot uh, about some important things in this book. And I think the last thing um, that I wanted to say was she's, she's very, um, she admires very much those women who have been able to take a stand. And she talks about the amount of stress that those women have had to go up against in order to take that stance, in order to stand up for what they believed in, in order to litigate if, if it actually came to that so that many of us today are able to pass through and not have to have that same level of scrutiny. But it's interesting now you will see Caucasians in the workplace with dreads. It's become more acceptable. Even uh, there are standards around doctors today wearing jeans and and and, and t-shirts <laughs> with the stethoscope around their their, you know, the standards have changed, but for us it means something different. So uh we'll get into more of this later, but I felt that uh that's very important. And what I wanted you to comment on, if you have something to comment on regarding this, I also want you to ask yourself, were there times where you felt that you had to sacrifice your individuality uh, for the sake of conformance to a cultural paradigm that is not yours? that was the majority races. We know they're not the majority because they're not people of color, but that's how we've been, you know, programmed in this country. So was there a time where 
you didn't wear, look the way you wanted to look, or maybe you didn't wear the hairstyle you wanted to wear, either because your white employer or your white counterparts may have felt uncomfortable, or the uh, people of color that you're around, the black people, the African Americans that you're around would have looked or shunned, or shunned you. Or comment and let me know if there's still people today, white or black or any other race for that matter, that have an issue or that you're able to sense verbally or non-verbally if they feel uncomfortable with your chosen way of, 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 of sporting your uh, creative, um, your creativity with regard to your hair. So let me know how you're feeling about this. I love you guys. I appreciate it. Sorry I had to get rid of videos one, two, and three because those were good, but they're definitely not worth a copyright strike, which can cause the channel to actually be deleted. I have countless claims already because of things that I put on the channel, but they're claims, which just means that the videos can't be monetized. If it becomes a strike, then the entire channel can be deleted. We definitely don't want that because many of you wouldn't be able to find me and they have the discretion to cause you or to disallow you from even starting new channels. So that is something that I don't want. I love all of y'all if you haven't purchased my book manifesting your manifest your masterpiece and you're all about that manifesting life and you're all about mindset clarity healing and clearing energetic blockages so that you can manifest your glory then uh make sure you get that book you can get it on amazon sending out lots of love to you i appreciate you joining me for this video remember these videos will be on wednesday evenings okay until we get through this and there's a lot of meat for just a certain amount of pages here. She gives a lot of historical context and a lot of meat. So definitely admire that. But we will be critiquing some of that as we get a little bit more intimate knowledge of who this person is because many of us don't know who she is and we can't find much information about her. So we have to go to the go to the um the origin. So I love y'all. Have a beautiful, peaceful, productive, and prosperous rest of your day whenever you're seeing this video. Loving on you, loving on me, and thank you for all of the shout outs, all of the love. Make sure you head on over to I Am Melanin Magic to get this for your micro locks or to get that oomsie, okay, those fragrance rocks to clear your energy. Shout out to all of you who are loving on them. Don't go, don't forget to go back and do your reviews. The oomsie is amazing. Uh, you won't need candles anymore. You definitely won't need those toxic uh, plugins anymore. You can get something all natural that is just amazing. It's spicy. It's aromatic. Like I said, it's all natural. Uh, it has aphrodisiac qualities. It can be medicinal because of the frankincense, the myrrh, and the countless other ingredients that are in this exotic blend that is handmade. Love to all of you all. You want to give it a try, then definitely uh, order the sampler. However, always try the original because the original is where it all came from and that's where you're going to find the strongest most pungent uh aromatics love to you again and i'll talk to you next time bye hey ladies do you love the way your skin looks and feels i know i do because i am using the i am melanin magic anti-aging serum and at 50 i love the way my skin looks and feels. This blend is bomb. It renews, revitalizes, rejuvenates, soothes, conditions, moisturizes, tones, brightens, and fades all in one step. So if you're ready to get your glow on, go get you some I Am Melanin Magic Anti-Aging Serum.